And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Would you pray with me as we just ask the Lord to teach us in our time together? Heavenly Father, I thank you. Lord, thank you that in your sovereignty that you have planned this Christmas day to fall on a Sunday. Lord, what a gift and joy it is to be able to gather today. As we come to your word today, we just ask that you would be our teacher, that you would open our eyes that we might see you. Lord, we know that you came to earth not for cleaned up, upright, good, healthy people. But Lord, you came to earth to save the wretched, the broken, the sinful, the sick, the wandering, the lost, those sitting in darkness. And Lord, that is all of us. Lord, we thank you that you have come for us to rescue us. We pray that as we come to your word for these few moments that you would lift our eyes that we might see Jesus, that we might behold him in his glory and leave here rejoicing. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. Well, I know that there are a million emotions associated with a morning and a day like Christmas. If we could just pull all of us in this room this morning, I'm sure we would get a wide range of emotions because all of us kind of feel something a little bit different on this day. Maybe some of us woke up with just a tremendous amount of happiness, or maybe there's just a lot of thankfulness going around your home or your friends today. Uh, maybe for you, there's kind of the opposite side of things. Maybe there's a lot of grief and mourning associated on today, a day like today. Maybe today is a really difficult day. Maybe for some of you today kind of marks a day of hope, kind of that the new year is right around the corner and that gets, you know, new, new starts and new beginnings. No matter what emotions we associate with, we are all told that today is supposed to be about one main emotion. That today, Christmas is supposed to be about joy. It's supposed to be a season of joy. We see it all over the malls. We see it all over commercials. It's supposed to be about joy, especially Christmas morning, right? right? That, that feeling when a, a child walks into the living room and sees the tree and sees the brand new bike, right? Joy. That's what it's today supposed to be about. That's what we're told it's supposed to be about. That feeling when you give a gift to a loved one and you watch them open it and they love it, right? Joy. Or that, that, that feeling of, of opening your door and seeing a, a big, bright red bow on a brand new Lexus in your driveway, right? I'm sure all of us have experienced that at some point. <laughs> Joy, right? We are told that this is to be a season of joy. And in fact, it's not just our culture that tells us this is supposed to be a season of joy. Actually, the Bible tells us this is supposed to be a season of joy. Christmas is supposed to be about joy. And in fact, if you've ever read any part of the Bible, you might find that God commands his people to be joyful. He commands his people to be joyful. We see it dozens and dozens of times throughout the Old Testament. In fact, if we would just kind of survey the, the most common command in the Bible, there, there are things like this. Do not be afraid. Rejoice. Give thanks. Thanks. We can kind of put all of these things together and say God is essentially commanding us to be happy and to be joyful. It's all over the Old Testament. Look at just a few passages here. In Deuteronomy, we see this command from the Lord. 
you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given you. Or in the Psalms, be glad and rejoice. Shout for joy. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. God commands his people to be joyful, to rejoice. It's not just the Old Testament. Jesus picks up on this too. As he comes to earth, here's what Jesus says. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven. Rejoice in that day, in the day that Christ will return and leap for joy. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven for those who believe. It doesn't stop with Jesus. It continues after Jesus dies, raises to new life, and ascends back to heaven. The Apostle Paul picks this up all throughout the New Testament and commands us to rejoice. Rejoice in hope. You should be glad and rejoice with me. And maybe the crescendo of the book of Philippians where it says rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. God's people are both commanded to rejoice and are characterized by rejoicing. But it feels strange to be told to be joyful, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel strange to be commanded to be joyful? Be happy. You're like, I can't. I can't. Don't tell me what to do. You can't command emotion from me. It feels weird to be told to feel something, doesn't it? It feels strange to be told to be joyful. Because what if I'm not? What if I'm down this morning? What if I'm mourning? What if I'm just filled with a sense of loss? What if I'm afraid? What if I'm worried? What if I'm lonely? What if I'm tired? What if what if I just don't want to be joyful? Like, what if everything in life is just kind of whatever, but I just don't want to be joyful? I might feel that this morning. I might say, I, I got family drama. I got financial stress. I got things in my life that I'm just not satisfied with. I don't want to be joyful. How can God possibly command emotion from us? That's what he's doing. How could God command us to feel something? It almost feels like, no, 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 that, that's my safe space. Emotions is my world. I live here. You don't come in here. You don't tell me what to do. I'm in charge here. Or I just experience whatever's happening on the outside and it just, I just feel this way. I can't help it. How could God command us to be joyful? Well, he can command us to be joyful because he's given us something that will produce joy when we behold it. He can command it from us because when God commands something, he creates what he calls for. He's given us something that when we behold it, it will produce joy in us. That's why he can command it. And he's given us something, something that we ought to never miss this morning. He has given us his son to redeem sinners. And when we behold that glorious truth, we will rejoice. We will rejoice. And that is the call this Christmas morning. Not just the vague call of the Christmas season. Right now, in this very place where you sit, the call this morning, this Christmas morning, is rejoice because Christ has come. Rejoice because Christ has come. No matter what you're carrying this morning, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're dreading, no matter what you're worrying about, right now you are called to rejoice because Christ has come. And the book of Luke holds this up for us so clearly. To give you some context for Luke chapter one, we pick up right in the middle of a story. There's a priest named Zechariah and his wife has been barren. They've been childless and they've longed for a child. They've prayed for a child for probably decades And God comes to Zechariah in the midst of him performing his priestly duties. And he comes to him and says to Zechariah, your prayer has been answered. Your wife will bear a son. And Zechariah's in disbelief. He's like, "Uh, how? How can this be? And the angel says to him, who appears to him, and says, well, the Lord's in charge. You can do whatever he wants. And because you didn't believe, you're going to be silent until the day that he's born. And so Zechariah gets nine months of silence to think about this whole thing. And the day that his son is born, well, a few days after his son is born, and they name him John, John the Baptist. He would be the one that would prepare the way for Jesus. He would tell the people that the Messiah was coming, the Savior was coming. So repent of your sins and receive the kingdom of God. The the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is about to be here. Get ready. 
The moment this, this son is born, John the Baptist, Zechariah, the scriptures tell us, is filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies. Meaning this, God gives him words to speak from God to the people. And he tells us, you know what he tells us all about? He tells us all about not his son that was born, but Jesus. Because Zechariah knew the purpose of his son was Jesus. He wasn't rejoicing in the fact that his son was born. He was mostly rejoicing in the fact that his son was preparing the way for the true son, the son of God. And look at what he tells us about this Jesus and why Christ has come. He tells us why we should rejoice. The first reason is this. We should rejoice because Christ has come to bring salvation. Look at what he says in verse 69 in Luke 1. He says, God has raised up a horn of salvation in this coming Jesus. Or in 75, he, he, he has brought, he, or in 74, that we might be delivered from the hand of our enemies. That the Lord would give us knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. This is what Jesus is doing to come. The very most fundamental reason Christ has come to earth is not to make your life easier. It's not to fill your life with more blessings. It's not to even give you a great example that you should follow and be inspired by. The fundamental reason Christ has come is to save you from your sins. Because we needed someone to save us from our sins. We needed a substitute in our place because we used to be stuck in sin. That's what's undergirding this whole prophecy of Zechariah, this understanding that all of us, without a Savior, are stuck in sin. We are stuck in rebellion against God. It's not that we just make bad choices or don't choose the best thing all the time. It's that we never choose the Lord on our own. We are stuck in our sins. And every time we sin, we make a statement about the Lord. He's not good. He's not trustworthy. Don't follow him. He's not worthy of giving your life to. He's a liar. We're stuck in our sins, and because of our sins, we owe a debt to the Lord. And the Bible's clear that the wages of our sin is death. That's what we owe to him. We cannot be in right relationship with him. But what does Zechariah rejoice in? He rejoices that God has raised up a horn of salvation. That in Christ, all of those who will believe in him can be saved from their sins. He's raised up a horn of salvation. That's a, a strange phrase to our ears, but it was a common phrase back in the day. The horn of an animal was considered their strength, their power. It was considered, if you will, the business end of the animal, right? The side of the animal that gets things done. It was the strength of the animal. And so when God says he's raising up a horn of salvation, he's saying, this is my strength. This is my business end, if you will. This is the part of me that gets things done, is the sending of my son Jesus to die on a cross for all of those who are stuck in sin. And anyone who will believe in him and follow him and trust in him will be saved. This is what Zechariah is rejoicing in. And he particularly emphasizes in verse 77, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins that Jesus pays the debt that we owe on the cross. He was born ultimately to die, to die in our place, to pay the debt that we owed for our sins. And all those who believe will be forgiven. The book of Acts in chapter 10 says very clearly, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We can have forgiveness of all of our sins, all of them, all of the sins that you are ashamed of this morning, all of the sins that every single one of us, every single day of our life, those, those memories of those sins that we can't seem to forget, that we regret every day and wish that we could change, yes, even those ones can be forgiven and wiped clean. That's good news. And why? How is it that God can do this? Verse 78, Zechariah says, because of the tender mercy of our God. You see, often we, we tend to think we need to earn somebody's forgiveness. That's how our relationships tend to work in real life, right? You wrong someone, they give you the cold shoulder, and now you have to go do the pursuing, right? You need to prove to them that you're sorry enough, that you understand the depths of how much you wronged them, and 
You need to feel the pain for a little bit so they know that you feel what they feel. And you kind of need to prove your worthiness to be forgiven. And we take that perspective to the Lord and think, well, yeah, okay, God forgives sins, but only those that really can, sh can show that they are really, truly ached and broken. And those that'll just carry the burden and be sad about their sins. Right? There must be some qualification for those at whom God will forgive. Well, Zechariah very clearly tells us there is a qualification, and it's this, the tender mercy of God. That Jesus Christ comes to forgive sins. Why? Not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, not because we asked for it, but because of the tender mercy of God. Which is good news for all of us this morning because none of us can earn God's forgiveness. It's called mercy for a reason. Because of the tender mercy of God, he offers his son in your place for all who will believe. Zechariah also highlights this in salvation. He says, so that we might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. That for all those who believe, not only do you get forgiven, you get God's righteousness. We talked about this a couple weeks ago in our series in the book of 1 Corinthians. We often long for be able to have a clean record. As we look back on all of our life and all of our sins, we, we long for a life of no regrets. But what's better than a life of no regrets is Jesus' righteousness given to you if you believe in him. He says, I'll take your record of sin and I'll give you my perfect record of righteousness. Amen. A record of perfection is better than a record of no regrets. Because when you believe in Jesus, you get gifted this new identity which says, it doesn't just simply say, never made the wrong choice. It's a new identity that says, always made the best choice. Because you have Jesus' righteousness if you believe. Friends, this salvation is better than we could possibly imagine. Which is why we're called to rejoice. Christ has come to save us from our sins. Zechariah also tells us this, rejoice because Christ has come to bring not just salvation, but to bring himself. He says in verse 68, for he has visited his people. He has visited his people. Or in 77, he's come to give knowledge of salvation. You see, we used to be alone and without God. All of us depending on ourselves, on our own strength, outside the fold of God's people, outside of his family, an enemy with God, the scripture would say. One great theologian said this, that outside of Christ, God is terrible. Outside of Christ, God is terrible. Now, friends, that is, that is not to say anything about the character of God and his goodness. It actually has everything to say about us and our own wickedness. And when we are outside of the mercy and forgiveness of Christ, we don't get to know the love of Christ. Therefore, he appears terrible to us because we pay the price for our sins as we stand before him. But for those who are in Christ, God is glorious. God is beautiful. He is full of tender mercy. Because the good news of the gospel is ultimately this, friends, that you get God. You get to have access to him. You get to have a relationship with him. You get to know him, which is what Zechariah is saying, that we would have knowledge of salvation. That's not intellectual knowledge. It's relational knowledge. It's experiential knowledge that you would know God, that you could be near to him, that he could be your father and you could be his son or daughter, that you could be redeemed and loved by him if you will come to him and believe. Rejoice, Christ has come to bring salvation. Rejoice, Christ has come to bring himself. And he closes this prophecy with this. Rejoice because Christ has come to bring light. I think these two verses right here are some of the most beautiful verses in all of the Bible. Verse 78, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Christ has come to bring light to those who sit in darkness. We used to be in darkness. Now all throughout the Bible, darkness is a metaphor all the time for people that are lost, that are stuck in sin, that are blind, 
that are dead, that are without hope. It is this metaphor to say that unless God does something, you are hopeless. You are lost in darkness and in death. Nighttime can be a really scary time. I'm sure we've all experienced this at some point in our lives. The same street that you could walk down at noon and is joyful and great and safe. You walk down the same street at two in the morning. It's terrifying, is it not? It's the same street, same location, but it's nighttime. It's scary, right? Or when you're sitting alone in your house, the same creaking noises that you would hear around lunchtime that you didn't even hear at one in the morning when you're binging that Netflix show, you're like, what was that? <laughs> Someone's in my house. It's, a ter- it's terrifying because why? It's nighttime. It's dark. I have had this moment as a parent, right? The same sickness or fever that my child would have in the morning versus in the middle of the night are experienced so differently because at nighttime, it's scary. The urgent cares are closed. Loved ones, support system are sleeping. I feel alone. I got to make the call as a parent for my sick kid. What do I do? Nighttime is scary. If you've ever experienced a dark and lonely, scary night, you know how much hope comes with the sunrise. If you ever watch a scary movie and it's daytime, it's like, okay, time to relax. Nothing scary is going to happen in this movie anymore because it's daytime. There is hope that comes with the rising of the sun as it sheds light onto the darkness and the darkness flees. Zechariah is saying to a dark world full of people stuck in darkness that with the coming of Jesus, he says, the sunrise shall visit us from on high. How beautiful is that? The sunrise shall visit us from on high. And I think he's thinking about the end of the Old Testament because the Old Testament closes in the book of Malachi with these words, for those of you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, spelled S-U-N, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, prophesying about Jesus. And here Zechariah is 400 years later saying that sunrise is coming to visit us from on high. And he's bringing healing in his wings. He's bringing life and hope and joy and healing with him. The scripture calls Jesus the son. The son. Not just the son of God, but the son. In fact, we're told at the very end of the scriptures in Revelation chapter 21, that when we join Jesus in heaven, that all those who believe in him and follow him, we will, we will join him in a new city. And it says, that city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. Why? For the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the lamb. That there will one day be no need for a sun anymore because Jesus will shine for us. And we will have all the light and life that we need. It's why our kids just sing, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. The birth of Jesus is the announcement that God has come to bring light and salvation to all who believe. And that same verse in Malachi that talks about the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings says right after it, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Look at the connection. When Christ comes, those of you who believe will go out of the stalls leaping like calves. When you see him, you will rejoice. When you behold him, you will rejoice. That is the call of Christmas. Rejoice because Christ has come. He commands it because he gives us something that produces it. If only we will behold him. Like the morning glory flower that opens to the light of the sun, our hearts will open to the light of Christ and pour out joy if we will look to him. 
Will you look to him this morning? Will you look upon Christ who has come to save sinners? Will you behold him? You see, you don't need to ignore everything that's going on in your life to behold him. Joy is not found in denying what is true. It's not found in denying what's going on in your life. Instead, joy is found in affirming what is also true, that Christ has come. Joy is to be had. No matter what I walk through, no matter what I feel this morning, Christ has come. And for all who believe, there is healing and life and joy. You know, it's often talked about that there is a threat to Christmas going around. That there's a threat to true Christmas joy. And there is. But it's not the commercialization of Christmas. It's not that people will say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. The true threat to Christmas joy is Christians being bored with the incarnation. It's Christians being bored with the gospel. When Christians look to the coming of Christ and are filled with joy, there is no threat to Christmas because it's alive and well because Christ has come. This ought to be the day, church, that we are filled with joy and happiness no matter what's going on in life. Today ought to be the day that we are so amped to come to church and rejoice with the people of God because it's what this day is about. It is about the coming of Christ. So the invitation for us this morning is to behold him, to look at the gospel, look at what he's done and what he's brought. There's forgiveness. There's righteousness. There's access to God. There's knowledge of God. There's life. There's peace. There's a truth that all that believe in him, nothing will separate you from the love of God. That for all those who believe in him, he'll work every single thing out in your life for your good. There's a promise that those who believe in him, he will bring you safely home. So church, smile. Literally, smile this morning. Christ has come. Rejoice. Be happy. Laugh. Lift up a shout. Sing. Embrace somebody. Not, ig- not, not ignoring what is true in your life, the hardship, but acknowledging what is also true. Christ has come. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what good, good news this morning. Better news that we could have hoped for. Better than any gift we could have opened under a tree. Better than any quality time we could have experienced this morning. Better than any rest. Better than any hope of a new year. You sent your son. Not only sent him, you gave him up for us. We were precious to you that you would give up your one and only holy, perfect, righteous son to redeem us. Lord, if we could know right now in this place, those that believe in you, if we could know how loved we are, we would rejoice. And so, Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, in this very moment, you would increase joy in our souls. And Father, for those here this morning that have yet to believe that you say are currently sitting in darkness, would you give them eyes to see the sunrise that has come, the hope that is to be found in you, Jesus? Would you help them believe? Jesus, would you increase our joy? We pray in your matchless and mighty name. Amen.